Today I'm going to talk about what makes neoclassical metal sound neoclassical. <laughs> I'll get into that right after this. What makes neoclassical metal sound neoclassical comes down to the chord cadences in that it uses the cadences of classical music. And by classical music, I mean the Baroque period, so late 1600s through the 1700s, and what we call the classical period, so the early to mid or late 1800s. Composers like J.S. Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, and then in the classical period, you got Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Tchaikovsky. Anyway, through that entire period, the harmonic structure of the music was propelled basically by the chord cadence. And it was a little bit different than what we use now as chord progressions. So we have a progression of chords, which just means a series of chords, one after the next after the next. And these days we can pretty much do it in, in any way we want, any order we want. You can even stick chords together that sound a little disjointed and, you know, maybe that's an interesting move. But back in the day, in this classical period, the rules were a little bit more defined you had what we call a chord resolution. So you had an unstable chord, and then it moves to resolve and become stable, like this. On the first chord, you know, it's, it's strong and it's up, but it doesn't feel finished until it lands on its resolution. But you can also play them as arpeggios, because what, after all, is an arpeggio? It's the notes of a chord just played one after another instead of sounded together. So if I did the E to the A minor again, it could look like this. As long as we keep these resolutions intact, you're going to feel that classical element and that's going to make neoclassical stuff sound neoclassical. Now the typical guitarist approach is that you might learn the scale and you know play a melody that relates to a scale, but then when it comes to chords, we're kind of in a different world and we learn chords as block shapes. You know, this is the major shape and you look at the root, let's say E, and you say that's E major, and then here's A, and this is A minor. And with that approach, what ends up happening is we don't really relate all the notes in a chord to the scale, and this kind of creates a problem. It makes things a little bit more difficult to understand. So let's fix that right here and now. I'm gonna play the A minor scale. I'm gonna play harmonic minor. Looks like that. And if we count the notes of the scale, of course, this is one, two, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. And then the octave is the eighth note, same as the first. Now let's talk about building chords. What is a chord? It's a note with harmony added on top of it. Okay, so the unit of harmony in Western music is what we call a third. And what's a third? Well, it's two steps of a scale. So if I started here on a note, any note, and I went up a scale and I went to the next note and I skipped that note and then another note, the distance from this note skipping a note to the next one, that's an interval of a third. And it happens at any point in the scale. So here in A, that's a third, but the second to the fourth is also a third, and the third to the fifth, and the fourth to the sixth. Those are all thirds. So let's build a chord now, and we're gonna start on the fifth step of the scale, so we're gonna play E. If I'm on five and I'm gonna go up the scale, the next step is six, in this case minor, so it's flat at six, but I'm gonna skip that note. I'm gonna go right to the seventh. So five to seven is an interval of a third. It looks like this. And then let's go from seven, we'll skip eight and we'll go to nine. So seven to nine is another third. And that ninth, if we drop it an octave, you'll see is the second relative to our original keynote. So the tones in the E chord are five, seven, nine, or two. 
So I could play the five chord to the one chord. Five chord. One chord. And there I'm creating that same classical cadence. And of course, because I'm playing with a uh, distorted metal guitar, it's neoclassical metal. Now let's add another harmony on top of the five chord. Sometimes you're going to hear people say, well, the five chord, we're going to call the root of the five chord one, because that's where we're going to kind of narrow our focus. We'll forget about the key entirely and just focus on that chord. And we're going to rename the fifth as one. If you called this one, then this is one, three, five. And you know the one, three, five, well, in chord construction, that's your straight major chord. And that's appropriate here because one, three, five are the three notes of the five chord. But remember, there are two numbering systems. One, three, five reflects the fifth step of the scale E as being one. But if we relate it to the key center, which is A, then the E note is not one, it's actually five, and we have five, seven, nine. So the tones five, seven, nine relate to the key center where one is, you know, our key note or our tonic note, our home bass note. So there are two different numbering systems here, and that can be a little bit confusing. But I think that the one that's most useful is to relate to the key center. In other words, look at the five chord as being made up of tones five, seven, nine. In any case, let's add another harmony on top of the five chord now. Now it's a dominant seventh chord. It's, it's what we call the five seven chord. And the five seven chord pulls even harder. Why does it pull harder? Well, this goes back to the idea that chords are not blocks that we're moving around. They are collections of tones. They are a note with harmony. And what's actually happening is that each one of these notes is either stable and at rest or unstable. If we go to our tonic note A and we look at what are the stable tones, well, the stable tone is going to be the root, obviously, the, the key center. That's going to be the most stable. And then the harmonies of that note are going to be stable as well. So that's root, our flatted third, and our fifth. In other words, the tones of the A minor chord. What notes are not stable? Well, two, four, six, and seven. Those tones are unstable. And if we take the unstable tones and create a chord using them, it's going to be an unstable chord and it's going to want to move. Well, how does it move? Each note of the chord wants to move from an unstable note to a stable note. So for example, the 5-7 chord. Well, it's got a fifth. So the fifth is stable and it could stay there. But look at the next tone. That's the seventh, and that's very unstable. It wants to rise and resolve to the root. The fifth of the five chord is this note, and that's also unstable. That's the second, and it wants to move. It could move down to resolve there, or it could go there. So as I play a little melody, you can see I'm playing the E chord and then I'm sliding to resolve to A minor. And then the seventh is here and it wants to fall to there. So, and that's the story of how the five seven chord pulls and wants to resolve to the one chord. Now, if we take that five chord and we drop out the root, so we drop the fifth out of it, play just the other three notes. Now we're playing the notes that are in the seven chord. In other words, if we added harmonies on top of seven, we have nine and 11, or seven, two, four. And again, very unstable chord, but you can see that 
the seven chord, the diminished chord built on the seventh step of the scale, is actually housed within the five seven chord. So they're really the same thing in, in a manner of speaking. The difference is whether or not, you know, the E is in there on the bass. Let's add another harmony. <laughs> Again, you feel the same pull. I'm just adding another harmony. I'm going up above 11 to the 13, flat 13 or flat six. And that is a half step above the fifth. Well, that's an unstable note as well. This arpeggio is called an E7 flat nine. <laughs> And the flat nine resolves by wanting to fall to the five. And you can hear that pull as well. And for the last step, let's see what happens if we take the root and drop it out of that E7 flat nine chord. Now we have just this. And that is a fully diminished seventh arpeggio. So if we come down, and then repeat it. Again, that's going to resolve nicely to our tonic chord. So what makes neoclassical sound like neoclassical? It's about using this authentic cadence, using the 5-1 or the 5-7-1 or the diminished 7th or, or fully diminished resolution. And they're really all kind of slight variations of the same idea, basically. I've laid the groundwork for you, so you have some idea, you know, how this works, what's going on. But at the same time, it's probably seeming quite abstract to you, you know, all these different numbers and Roman numerals and, you know, all these numbers flying around here. It's, it gets very confusing. You don't really understand it and really get a handle on it until you take this information and you apply it to real music. That's where the rubber meets the road and you start saying, oh, I see what's going on here in this music, in this situation, in this situation. And after a couple of those, now you really have a working understanding of how all this stuff works. And then, of course, you can use it. So there are two ways that I have for you to apply this information and really get it working for you so that you really own it. The first one is on my website, I have a masterclass, the Beethoven masterclass, and it's running through the third movement of the 23rd piano sonata. It's called a Passionata. And, you know, it's a very advanced piece, difficult technique, so it's a technique workout. But I also go through a good amount of the theory explanation of what's actually happening there. So there's an opportunity to actually learn some of the music from this time period on the guitar and connect the dots between, you know, these, these cadences we're talking about and actually see them and hear them in operation. The other thing you can do is continue in this series. The next video in this series is on Patreon. I'm going to go through this piece, at least the beginning of it. This is part of Paganini's fifth caprice. Now, of course, this is another advanced technique. I mean, it's supposed to be played really fast, but I'm not going to worry about the speed here. I'm just going to show it to you very slowly, and we're going to look at the analysis of it so that you can see how the classical cadences are working here and why it sounds the way it does. And when you come out of that, you're going to understand how to play neoclassical metal because all you do is pick up those cadences and apply them in a rock context and, and there you go. I'll also show you the two licks I played at the beginning of this video, you know, some, some diminished ideas and scale runs and how to play neoclassical scale runs so that they actually imply these chord progressions because that's what makes it sound neoclassical. So all that is over on Patreon. And of course, don't forget about the Beethoven Masterclass. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video.